You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. Hello and welcome back to Let's Talk Creation uh, with Paul and Todd. I am Todd Wood. And I'm Paul Garner. And we're here, especially this episode, to talk about a pretty important historical event that happened about 60 years ago. And that is the publication of this book right here that I have, The Genesis Flood. It's published by two gentlemen, uh, John Whitcomb and Henry Morris. And it kind of introduced the larger world of evangelical theology uh, to the idea of what we now think of as flood geology. And yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Paul, I I grew up, so you just held up that blue and yellow printing, Mm. right? Yeah. That's what I grew up with, right? My parents... My mom went to hear, I think it was my mom, went to hear Dr. Whitcomb speak when I was a little kid, real little. Mm. And uh, our church that I grew up in, they had, they had sort of went along with whatever the Schofield Bible said, uh, which mm. was essentially gap theory. We talked about that in a previous episode, which you might want to listen to. Um and uh, after hearing Dr. Whitcomb speak, she came back and said and, and shared that information with the pastor. And then from that point on, that church, my church, was full on young age creationist. And so in my house growing up, we had that blue and yellow book. And I remember many occasions uh, looking through it and, and being amazed at the at the pictures of the fossils and then reading it and learning about all of these huh, remarkable ideas that these men had put together into in this book and so the genesis flood was <laughs> uh, super important in in my life right i mean it's probably why i am doing what i'm doing it's probably why i believe what i believe um, anything similar in your life, Paul? Do you do you have similar impact from that book? Yeah, I, I do. Um, I I didn't grow up in a Christian home, and I think we talked about this way back in our first episode when we introduced ourselves. Sure. Um, I became a Christian when I was ten years old through being introduced to a local evangelical church youth youth group. Uh, But I very quickly came into contact with creationist literature. And when I was a teenager, um, somebody loaned me a copy of the Genesis Flood. And I read it avidly. Um, I was already interested in rocks and fossils and all of these kinds of things and had been even before I was a a Christian. I was always, you know, a bit bit of a fossil collector. And uh, it had a huge impact you know, on, on my thinking. This was probably one of the first really serious creationist books that I read, sure. sort of, of, of a more academic kind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And it's, it's, it's no small thing to read this. I mean, this is, no. this is 500 <laughs> pages of dense text about just yeah. about everything you could imagine um, talking about. And so, yeah, this was not, you know, for, for young people to sit down and read this book, that was that's not a trivial achievement. <laughs> um, so yeah, 1961, this book comes mm. out. It has a history. We thought we might uh, chat a little bit about that uh, in this episode, and maybe talk more about what's in the book and what came after uh you know our next episode so we'll see how that goes we'll see how how it works out um so paul uh as i recall the story 
Henry Morris was a professor. He was a, an engineering professor at Virginia Tech. And he had been interested for a very long time before this book appeared, uh, he'd been very interested in a very long time in the idea of um, Christianity, faith and science, apologetics, and so forth. He had already written books on this subject uh, in the 40s. And so uh, the, the, the Genesis Flood was kind of the next step in what he had already been working on. Um, but the ideas in the book, uh, yeah, the, the emphasis in the Genesis Flood on this concept of flood geology, that the important thing that we need to be paying attention to in, in Genesis 1 through 11 is not just, not just the creation account, but also the account of the flood. So this was, this was in a sense, I think, kind of new to people. People had long been talking about how to reconcile geology and and the Bible in various different ways, and, and most of those ways dealt with the creation week. And now Morris comes along with uh, uh, this young man, John Whitcomb, who, had, who was just finishing up his, um, his doctorate, and they have this book on the flood. So where, Paul, help us refresh my memory. Where is this, where are these geology ideas coming from at the very least? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. So, so Henry Morris, um, basically, uh, he, he was a scientist. Uh, he a had a PhD from the University of Minnesota. He was essentially a hydraulic engineer. Uh, he... Uh, served on the faculty of secular universities throughout the 30s and 40s, uh, well, 40s and 50s and 60s. And uh, as you say, he was already sort of interested in these questions of science and faith, and he was writing about these sorts of topics. And he was influenced by people like Harry Rimmer, you know, who was an old earth creationist and, and you know, people of that kind. But in 1943, Henry Morris is doing some library uh, research, and he comes across the name of someone called George McCready Price. And uh, he looks up George McCready Price's book called The New Geology. Now, I have a copy here of McCready Price's The New Geology. Price was a Seventh-day Adventist, and Price w was almost a kind of lone voice in the first half of the 20th century advocating what we now understand as flood geology. And this was perhaps his major work, although he was prolific. You know, he wrote an enormous amount, many books and many articles. But this 700-plus page book uh, was his kind of magnum opus. Yep. And uh, Henry Morris looked this book up, and it had a, an enormous impact on his thinking. So really from the time that he first encountered the ideas that Price was advocating in that book, Henry Morris abandoned any efforts to harmonise the Bible with the idea of an old earth. And he adopted a, a, a young creation, a recent creation, and uh, the, the idea of a global flood as an explanation for the Earth's geology. And uh, that was 1943. Now in 1953... Uh, Henry Morris um, visits the campus of Grace Theological Seminary in Winona Lake in Indiana. And uh, he goes there to present a paper as part of a, a meeting of the American Scientific Affiliation, which is an organisation for Christians in the sciences. And the paper that he gives at that meeting is entitled Biblical Evidence for a Recent Creation and Universal Deluge. And present at that meeting was uh, this young uh, Old Testament scholar. He was a lecturer at the seminary, I think, at the time, uh, John Wickham. And Wickham um, is greatly inspired by Henry Morris's lecture. And it's really as a result of hearing that talk that, that Wickham then devotes the next four years to uh, his doctoral 
dissertation, which is about the Genesis flood. And uh, he completes that in 1957. And uh, Wickham and Morris themselves um, become firm friends. They, they get to know one another and uh, they uh, agree to collaborate together, to work together, essentially on the book that becomes the Genesis flood. And it's Wickham's doctoral dissertation that is basically the basis of then what becomes the Genesis flood in 1961. Uh, they co-opt a number of other scholars, uh, a number of scientists, biblical scholars and, and, uh, and other uh, experts to act as reviewers on their manuscript. And in February 1961, the Genesis flood appears. It's published by uh, a book publishing company called Presbyterian and Reformed. So that's that's basically sort of in, in a short order how the Genesis flood came to be written. All right. <clears throat> So I wanted to think about um, the impact because I have here mm. a recent printing of, of the Genesis Flood. Uh, and this, as I look in the front of the book here, this is the, oh, no, this is not recent. This is 1996, and it is on its 40th printing. So... Oh. It's gone through a lot of copies. This book is extremely common. And uh, it's not just because they wrote a good book. Um, there are historical circumstances that come into play here. And I think it's really, this is going to be a fun conversation because what happens in the United States is quite different from what happens in the UK. And so this is going to be an interesting little history lesson. So let's just go back. Let's not go back too far, but let's just go back to the publication of, of Origin of Species, right? And the first time it's, it's proposed in a, in a compelling fashion, a way that actually convinces people that, that species have evolved from common ancestors over long eons of time. And a little bit of hint there at the end of the book that human beings should be included in this process, that we also are products of evolution. This caused a bit of a stir, shall we say. Um, there was some resistance initially in the UK, as I recall, but by about 1875, so Origin was published in 1859, and in the fall of 1859, by 1875, basically 15 years later, most, let's call them informed uh, scientists, professors, and, and those types of folk had come over and come around to Darwin's view. Uh, and then there was a bit of argument. So the argument was about natural selection. There were lots of people who were still rather skeptical of this idea that natural selection could actually explain evolution, uh, and this is among evolutionists themselves. This is not this is not the religious critics. This is the evolutionary biologists and paleontologists and so forth arguing over how do how do we explain evolution? They had come to accept Darwin's idea that it happened, but they didn't really agree on the mechanism. So you get. And, and historians have called this period the eclipse of Darwin, and it lasts from about 1875 until about the 1930s. And in the 1930s, that's when you have the emergence of uh, the development of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, which is a big bunch of words, and it basically means the genetics people got together and sort of worked out the math of how evolution and natural selection could actually produce evolution. And they did it in a way that basically convinced other geneticists, and then from there it spread to other areas of biology and so forth. So by the time basically the 1950s rolls around, scientists have sort of put away the arguing about natural selection, and they've come to say it happened by means of the neo-Darwinian synthesis. Natural selection is the major mechanism of evolution. So all that's happening among what you would what we would consider as sort of the conventional university crowd, the people who study evolution and so forth. 
In the meantime, and this is where it gets interesting, in the U.S., right, in the U.S., we have this, this idea of the separation of church and state. We do not have a government-sponsored church or religion. And what that means, practically speaking, is that American uh, Protestantism, to, in particular, uh, tends to be very populist in the sense that uh, we have, you know, and, and I hate to, you know, trivialize it, but there are a lot of fads that run through American um, Protestant theology. People, you know, they start having meetings, and so then you have they develop their own little following and then they, you know, that's a church and it happens over and over. And, and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying this is, this is characteristic of how it works in the U S because you have compelling speakers, compelling writers who are able to convince crowds and so forth. So even while sort of the academic world is going along with this and even some, some seminaries are, are connecting in with evolution as well and trying to come up with the sort of a Christian version of evolution. You still have this huge, huge swath of American Christians, Protestants especially, who are highly, highly skeptical and are being taught by, uh, shepherded by pastors who are also highly skeptical of evolution. So, it's, it's this strange dichotomy where the sort of academic world thinks all these sort of questions have been resolved and we're all either Christian evolutionists or evolutionists of some type. And the rest of society, which, no, <laughs> not at all, they're still very much in the essentially in the in the mindset of young age creationism. Um, that's still the case. Now, in England... And in the UK, mm. I think things are a little different. Is that right, Paul? Yeah, well, I, I think in England, you know, we, we have an established uh, state church, the Church of England. And because we, we have the Anglican Church, um, at, you know, it, it plays a big role in national life and, and in, in the life of the English state. Uh, and I think what that means is that... Uh, in, in effect, it, it kind of keeps our Christianity quite middle of the road in, in many ways. Um, you know, our, our, our Christianity, um, we, we, we didn't really have, you know, the kind of cultural clashes that uh, you saw in America, um, you know, between fundamentalists and, and, yeah. and others. So, right. you know, so, so we, we kind of didn't really have any of that. Now, it's always difficult, isn't it, to know exactly what the... Um, person in the pew yeah. thinks about topics like creation because all we know is what the people who are writing books and articles are saying about it right. and so you know who who knows exactly you know where the average kind of church girl was but my my sense is that probably um, most Christians in England throughout the 20th, 20th century certainly the first half of the 20th century we're probably pretty relaxed about the whole idea of, you know, evolution yeah. and its compatibility with scripture or, or at least with the idea of an old earth and it's, you know, and, and, and harmonizing that with scripture. So that, that would, that would be my sense. Sure. And there are probably, there are a few holdouts, you know, who, who, um, you know, I can think of a, a few books that are published in the first half of the 20th century by people who are skeptical of, of Darwinism, skeptical of evolution, but by and large, I think the the church in England had probably made its peace with Darwin at that time. Yeah, yeah, that that was my impression too. But in the U.S., of course, we have sort of this this more populist approach, and mm -hmm. that that world, that community, that I don't know, that area of our culture is keeping alive this idea of creation and that evolution must necessarily be bunk in some way i maybe i don't know how but i don't know what those scientists are talking about but it's crazy and i don't believe it mm. and so that's sort of your average your average creationist thinking about evolution there and then along comes a man named 
uh, William Jennings Bryan. Bryan is a politician. He <laughs> is a very much a fundamentalist Christian. And he is also uh, a firm, strong pacifist. And he uh, was serving as Secretary of State, which is a pretty high position in American government. It's, you know, there's the president mm -hmm. and the vice president. And then the Secretary of State is essentially kind of a representative of the actual government itself. So very high position in the government. And he, as a pacifist, very much wanted to prevent war. And when World War I broke out and dragged the U.S. into it, he was extremely disillusioned and upset. And the big thing that struck him was the way that uh, the German people especially were approaching this idea of, of survival of the fittest and natural selection, right? So what, what Brian began to think was that the, the root of the evil of war in Europe was evolution, that, these, that, that, that this, this war had broken out because people thought I'm better than you and you, I, I can make you do what I want or I can drive you to extinction and there you go. And it was essentially what we think of now as social Darwinism. It, it, it's a term that we use for, for ideas at the time where people were sort of trying to, to, to apply the survival of the fittest or, or natural selection to social situations. And I don't know of anybody who thinks that's a good idea anymore. Um, you know, it's sometimes we, we, we talk about the evil fruits of evolution, and I think that was perhaps an evil fruit in the past, but I don't, I don't know that any evolutionary biologist today would actually advocate anything like that. Maybe some would, but I, I don't think so. Um, but it was a big deal, and it was a big shock to Brian. Brian began to speak out against evolution. And in the 1920s, he actually began a, a pretty intense crusade uh, going around promoting uh, uh, anti-evolution, basically, that, that, um, that the education of our children needs to be about creation and not about this horrible doctrine that led to such a terrible, horrible war. And so states, and this is how, and this is another difference here between the UK and, and the US. Here in the US, most of the education is, is at the at the time largely controlled in the local community, um, local communities, and it still mostly is. It's mostly funded and paid for by local counties in in states, and so the states began passing these laws that we're trying to basically outlaw evolution. And, and in the state of Tennessee, where I live, uh, they passed what's called the Butler Act. It's a very short little act, and it basically says uh, that it would be illegal in any state-sponsored school in the, in the state of Tennessee to teach any theory that contradicts the origin of humans as described in the Bible. And notice it's specifically about the origin of humans, uh, Brian really didn't care about evolution of animals, the evolution of plants. It didn't matter. But for him, the idea that you could apply this to, to human origins and human society and culture was appalling. And you know as well as I do, Paul, what this led to. Um, as, soon as, that, as soon as that law um, uh, made it into law, the, the governor of Tennessee signed it into law, the American Civil Liberties Union, which was a brand new organization, just a year old at that time, they began to advertise in Tennessee newspapers looking for someone to volunteer to break the law so that they could uh, take it to court and get it overturned and declared unconstitutional as, as a violation of the freedom of teachers to teach what they need to teach. And that led to uh, the Scopes trial, famous Scopes monkey trial, uh, which happened just a couple of blocks away from where I'm sitting right now. 
uh, in the in the old Ray County Courthouse, which is still standing, uh, where William Jennings Bryan showed up in town to help to prosecute a young man named John Scopes, who volunteered to be the patsy in this trial. Uh, and then on the other side, the famous lawyer uh, Clarence Darrow came to town in order to defend him. And it was quite a big show trial. Uh, happened in July of 1925, one of the hottest years on record. So it was kind of a miserable time. And I've I've lived through 20, uh, almost 21 um, Tennessee summers, and they are quite unpleasant, I'll tell you that. The mm. air is like hot soup. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, so all of this happens, and, and Scopes is eventually uh, found guilty, and it's not clear that he ever actually was genuinely guilty because he was only a substitute teacher. Uh but what happens from that? This is the important part. Uh, the 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 campaign against evolution, the public campaign against evolution, and the furor around the Scopes trial led book publishers to say, "All right, you know, we don't really need people getting mad at us about our books. We want them to buy our books, right?" Makes sense. And so what we're going to do is we're going to stop talking specifically about evolution in our textbooks. Now, they kept the concepts. They kept talk. They talk about variation. They talk about inheritance and all the sorts of things that go into ingredients of evolutionary theory. But they didn't really call it evolution. Right. And so they would leave out sort of the conclusions that one might come to. Uh, from these ideas. And so for the next essentially uh, 35 years, uh, high school biology education here in the United States was conducted with textbooks that didn't really mention much about evolution at all. You've been listening to Todd and Paul Talk Creation. If you'd like more information on sponsorship opportunities, or maybe you'd like to have a product or book reviewed or discussed on our podcast, please contact us at podcast at corsi.org. That's podcast at corsi.org. Do you have questions regarding the Young Age Creation as a model? Well, we've got you covered with a book by podcast owned Paul Garner. His book, The New Creationism, was dubbed the single best book on creation and the flood by filmmakers of Is Genesis History. If you don't already have a copy, be sure to check it out on Amazon today. Now, let's get back to the podcast. Now, again, Paul, I'm, I suspect things might have been different in the UK. Yes, um... You know, we, we I, I think creationism has always uh, been this kind of political football in America yeah. in the way that it is not in, in Britain. And so it, it just isn't here, this kind of politically charged um, subject of, you know, trials and court cases and uh, litigation about what goes into textbooks and yeah. you know all of this that that is very definitely an american phenomenon and not something that really has ever happened here in the uk right yeah, and it sort different. of gives it it sort of gives that impression that creationism is somehow this weird american aberration right um, yes that is exactly how a lot of British people would kind of look at it. They would they would think of creationism as something that happens over on the other side of the pond. Right. And, <laughs> and those is, unruly is, colonists are at it again. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, yeah. Even yeah. though um Britain actually has the oldest uh, extant creationist organization in the world that's right. which is the creation science movement formerly the evolution protest movement that began in 1932 yes so we have the oldest one and it's still going um uh, you know so so it it, it isn't a peculiarly american uh, phenomenon no. but that is how a lot of no. british people would would look at it yeah 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 and it's because of all that weird publicity we get yeah. from going to court yeah. about everything 
because you know we're americans and you can't tell us what to do and we're gonna do what we want and let's go to court and fight about it yeah that, that's a very american thing to do anyway back to the story so over here in america we have that 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 long period of textbooks that just don't the publishers are skittish they're nervous they don't want to put evolution in the textbook they don't want to stir up problems now politically the move to sort of ban evolution sort of died out after the trial i think a lot of people were sort of when the when the when the out of town uh reporters came to town to report on on this trial the general attitude was that this is some sort of backwater hick town and they don't know what they're talking about and this is just a huge embarrassment and we shouldn't be doing this um so that was sort of the 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 big town, big city newspaper perspective. And so that became kind of everyone's perspective on, on the Scopes trial. And, and so the big efforts to, to ban uh, evolution just sort of fell apart at that point. But, you know, as I say, the textbook publishers are still skittish and still nervous and they don't want to go back to that and they don't want to have people not buying their textbooks. So they just sort of quietly make sure that there's not a lot of evolution in their biology books. Then, and as I've already said, I already described that, that history of science where you have the development of the Neo-Darwinian synthesis and the spread of that through, through other disciplines in the 30s and 40s and 50s. So that by the time 1959 comes around, a large group of scientists uh, decided, you know, we need to have a celebration of the anniversary of the publication of Origin of Species, right? So Origin of Species was uh, 100 years old in 1959, and they organized this massive symposium at the University of Chicago. It was called the Darwin Centennial. And at that symposium, the general consensus emerged uh, among the, the attendants there that it had been too long uh, since not having you know evolution in the American biology classroom. Uh, so this idea, that you know, we should keep going and not, and educating students, but not tell them about evolution, just seemed preposterous to them, because now, in their world of academic uh, biology and paleontology and so forth, everybody was an evolutionist. There wasn't anybody who didn't accept it, although there there were. They just hadn't really asked very much, but yeah, there were people like that. But but they just you know these folks decided yeah everybody agrees in evolution, and so we've got the neo Darwinian synthesis. We've answered all the all the debates that we had, and so we ought to develop a new generation of textbooks that have evolution as a major theme in the book. And that's 1959. In the 60s, then, you have the products of that, which are biology books, a new generation of biology books that not only talk about evolution openly and explicitly, they also have basically evolution as a central theme to what they're doing. And I've done a lot of historical research on this area, and I've, I've looked at all sorts of, of um, archives of correspondence and so forth. And what's fascinating to me, I've seen lots of letters that basically tell a similar story where you have parents who grew up uh, prior to 1959, where they didn't know, you know, they didn't study evolution in high school. They didn't know anything about it. They were mostly just, you know, they went to the local church and they were creationists and by default, because that's what we were. And their kids then were coming home in the 60s saying, my teacher says nobody believes in creation and everybody believes in evolution. Or my teacher says no, biology doesn't even make sense if you don't have evolution. Um, and there was this enormous culture shock that came about because of that. And so 
when the Genesis flood appeared, this was not just some random book at some random time. This book <laughs> came at the very beginning of all of this cultural upheaval that was coming about from uh, this strange history of, of education in the United States. And so it became a rallying point, really. I mean, the, the, the book laid out this model, this idea of what Earth history ought to be envisioned as, and for all of those parents and pastors and Christians in the nation who were suddenly hearing all this stuff from their kids uh, about evolution, it was a place to go. It was a point for them to say, no, this mm -hmm. is the real history of the Earth, not Darwin, not origin of species. It's, it's the Genesis Flood. And so the Genesis Flood, you know... I, I, <laughs> I don't know that I want to say it was God's providence. I think that's a bit presumptuous, but it's an awfully curious uh, history there that that book happens to come out just at that right time uh, mm -hmm. in history when all of this upheaval was happening and it becomes this, this enormous runaway bestseller. Mm -hmm. um, 40 printings in the 90s, right? And who knows mm -hmm. how many by this point. Um mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, if, if, if you if if you're reticent to say that it was God's providence, then I'll say it. I, I think okay. it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and and I think I think that's very helpful because you know it. I think what you've said helps to explain why the Genesis flood had the impact that it had, right. because as I think we're we're going to go on to see. There were precursors, you know, it didn't come out of nowhere. It, it wasn't uh, birthed in a vacuum. And th there were other books that had said similar things, even in the 20th century. But it was the Genesis flood that had the impact. And I, I think what you said about the context in which it was it was written, you know, it comes out just a couple of years after that Darwin centennial with all, with all of this sort of background. Uh, it just sort of helps to explain you know, why it was the catalyst for this sort of rebirth of, of, of young age creationism at that particular time. So that, that's very helpful. Yeah. And it sort of gives you the sense of why <clears throat> then in the U.S. at least we have all of these court cases that follow <laughs> shortly after, right? We, we have um, uh, Epperson versus Arkansas in the 60s that basically overturns the anti-evolution law in Arkansas. In Tennessee, it was just it was just repealed. Basically, we just quietly repealed it, our our anti-evolution law. And then in the in the in the early 80s, then you have new uh, uh, cases of um, people trying to get at least. Uh, an even treatment of creationism in the classroom, in the high school classroom. Uh, and those are being uh, rejected. But, but a lot of that is still motivated by the ongoing impact of the Genesis flood. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it sort of makes sense to me that people think about creationism as a power struggle, right? So sometimes, mm -hmm. Paul, I'm sure you've, you've heard this, that this is all just a big power struggle about what's going to go on in the classroom and that's all creationism is and it's just a lot of yeah. poppycock or bunk or whatever. Yeah. And, and you know, as well as I do, there's way more to it than that. Yeah. Um, so, but it makes sense when you see sort of how things unfolded here in the United States that that book hit at the right time, made the right sorts of arguments that really made it a compelling, um, a compelling model to think through. So, so Paul, you mentioned there were precursors to this book these other people who had yeah. been talking and one of them was george mccurdy price in that massive 700 page new geology yeah. book which we have a copy yeah. of as well uh yeah yeah so i've given you kind of an idea of why that never really took off how about you how about you give us a little tour of of what those other th things were and what they said yeah 
No, well, well, very good. So I, I actually want to go back a lot further, even than George okay, McCree Price. Okay, let's go because, back even further. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, I think, yeah, it's helpful to kind of look at the the overall history here because so often uh, the idea of young age creationism and flood geology is portrayed as this kind of 20th century innovation, as, as yeah. if, you know, somehow it was kind of invented in 1961. And this is <laughs> okay. just so far from reality. Um, belief in a worldwide flood that had geological effects is not a new idea. And I think that we can even uh, see in kind of embryonic form uh, these kinds of ideas in the writings from, of, of the church fathers, you know, from the, from the earliest days of the, the Christian church. So you have people like um, Tertullian, uh, who speaks about fossils in mountains as evidence that the earth was once covered in water. And although he doesn't make it clear that, you know, he's he's thinking about the Genesis flood, you know, he might be, he, he probably has the flood in yeah. mind there. Yeah. And uh, you have somebody called Procopius of Gaza, who also talks about shells and other sort of fragments that are found in the mountains. And he says, you know, these these speak of the, this worldwide flood, the time when the, the earth was underwater. So you, so you have these uh, sort of embryonic ideas, e even in the church fathers. And then, you know, come forward in time to the time of the Reformation, and, you know, it's quite clear when you read um, people like Calvin and Luther that they took the Bible's account of the flood seriously. They believed it was a worldwide event. Um, Luther, again, you know, points to fossils of fishes and other animals, uh, you know, as evidence, you know, these are the creatures that died during the flood. And he even, you know, refers to the present day configuration of continents, mountains and oceans uh, being a result of the flood. So he's clearly thinking about the flood as being this sort of completely world transforming, um, you know, earth shaping event. And then we kind of, you know, fr from the time of the Reformation where, you know, arguably the, the, the uh, scientific sort of worldview is, is birthed, um, we have early naturalists in the 17th century. Uh, this is a time before science, as we sort of currently understand it, is 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 really you know has really taken shape. But there are these early naturalists. They're often sort of polymaths who are interested in all kinds of you know ideas, philosophy, and uh, biology, and geology, and chemistry. You know that that they, they're all polymaths, and. Uh, Two names in particular, sort of, uh, uh, that we can think about: Thomas Burnett yes. and John Woodward. Uh, they're writing about the uh, beginning of the 18th century, end of the 17th century, and uh, they think that the Earth has been shaped by the catastrophic events of the flood. John Woodward interprets fossils as the remains of creatures that, that you know were overwhelmed by the floodwaters. So these were ideas that were even there, you know, in in these sort of early scientific thinkers. But then um, we kind of go through this period, and I know you've talked um, quite a bit about this, and perhaps you could sort of fill in some of the details here. But we go through a period where increasingly the Bible gets sidelined. Yeah. And people say, look, you know, we, we should study nature uh, independently. Uh, you know, we, we can go to nature and uh, we, we shouldn't be interpreting nature through through the lens of Scripture. And that kind of eventually, uh, although that wasn't the motivation of those people originally, but it eventually kind of paves the way for the Enlightenment and the rise of scientific naturalism um so I, I don't know if you want us to just say something about yeah, that, sure. that kind of divorce yeah. you know where, where people set the bible to on one side it it, it sort of starts with protestantism it and that has something mm -hmm. to do with it where you have sort of quite a long time of religious conflict that comes out of that um, mm. and then you have uh also political upheaval so in uh, as as the first um, 
the first continuously existing scientific society, the Royal Society of London, is birthed in England. It's essentially right about the period of the English Civil War, where you have the parliamentarians and the royalists, and you, you can tell me more about that story, um, <laughs> uh, going at it. And so you have this period of time where there's a lot of conflict. And the Royal Society got together for the purpose of sort of exploring this new idea of natural philosophy, this new concept that we can use observation to learn about the world around us. Um, mm. And yet it may sound weird, but it was kind of a new innovation. Prior to this, if you wanted to learn about anatomy or if you wanted to learn about astronomy, you would consult the ancient authorities on the subject who had learned what had needed to be learned, right? And so this notion that you would go out and observe things for yourself, that was that was presumptuous and arrogant. You don't do that. Um, but the, the big debate over the structure of the cosmos, geocentrism and heliocentrism and so forth, that became kind of one of the, the catalysts here to change to change the view and the ideas about how scientists ought to, how science ought to be conducted. And in this climate of conflict where you could basically uh, have a disagreement that would break out into essentially a fatal <laughs> fight, um, people, you know, the Royal Society just decided, you know what we're going to do? We're not going to, we're not going to talk about religion. We're not going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about Demonstrations. They they thought of them as demonstrations, which was essentially, you know, observations and experiments. So, on the one level, it sort of makes sense that you would want to be able to do that just so you could get a parliamentarian and a royalist, uh, or a or a puritan and a and a latitudinarian in the same room and be civil to one another. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it takes on this much bigger sense that really we shouldn't be bringing the Bible in to overrule what we can observe, right? Mm -hmm. I can see, I can see these things for myself, these, and I can logically imagine what the necessary deductions are. And so, yeah, we shouldn't be consulting the Bible. And it takes a while. That really takes off in the, in the, in the late 1600s, well, the mid to the late 1600s, um, that whole attitude that we're not going to really talk about what the Bible says in order to correct what science is doing, because science is observation. It's deduction. It's just fact. So, yeah, we're not going to... If, if the Bible seems to disagree, then it must be that the Bible is intending to speak metaphorically in that in that passage or in that sense. And so yeah, so you've get you get Thomas Burnett, you get uh, these early geologists, uh, Steno, Nicholas Steno, they're all highly religious. They're all thinking very much about um, about their disciplines in religious terms, explicitly biblical terms. Uh, but as time goes by, you get more and more people who are willing to say, you know, you can't really, no, Bible isn't going to tell you about science. The Bible's just not, it's not a science book. It's not supposed to tell you about science. It's science tells you about science. And so eventually you get people who would say, well, I think the history of the earth is really old, right? So you get people like, um, uh, Cuvier in France who, who, who would argue, you know, there's, there's countless catastrophes, not just the flood, um, mm. that have occurred on this planet and buried many different eras of creatures and the fossil record and so forth. And so, yeah. So you have these scientists who basically propose these biblical ideas of how, how you might read the Bible that would allow for an old earth. You get the gap theory. You get day-age theory and, you know, maybe the days of Genesis are really long periods of time and so forth. Uh, and so it gives sort of the sense that we're all in agreement. We've all worked this out, and this is how it is. And science has just given us the truth, and and the Bible we figured out is it should be interpreted in some other way. And so, yeah. And the thing I think that really uh, 
kind of broke the camel's back. The straw that broke the camel's back was was Origin of Species, where science sort of unhindered, if you will, or unfettered by biblical revelation just decides, hey, you know, man's not a special creation. We evolved from we evolved from ape like creatures, just like the chimpanzee yeah. and the gorilla. So Yeah. And of course in in uh in the realm of geology uh, 1795 we have uh, james hutton and his theory of the earth uh you know he's and we can kind of see i think some of his deistic uh sort of philosophical leanings kind of coming through in his idea that um normal processes that we can observe in the present day have just gone on cycling in the past you know for for millennia there's no vestige of a beginning, no prospect of an end, right. you know. Uh, and, of course, this this idea of uniformitarianism is then picked up and popularised by uh, Charles Lyell um, in uh, the early 1830s. And, of course, that has a big impact on Darwin because Darwin, you know, reads Lyell. So when we come sort of to the mid-19th century and we, uh, we, we have, uh, you know, the publication of The Origin of Species... Um, interestingly, at around that time, there is a bit of pushback, isn't there, f on uh, some of these geological theories, um, perhaps yes. surprisingly. But we have this group of uh, people that have become known today as the scriptural geologists or the mosaic geologists. And um, they're kind of, a, they write a number of books and articles and pamphlets, and they're basically defending Genesis as a, a true historical account uh, they believe that noah's flood was a worldwide catastrophe they're challenging the idea of long geological ages but they're not entirely agreed are they about exactly the shape of what takes the place of these these uh, old earth geological theories so there's still a lot right. of diversity among uh, among these guys you know about which parts of the geological yep. record are actually yep relate to the flood and which are before the flood and which are after the flood and, you know and all of these we, kinds of things and how do we explain the different features of the fossil record you know where coal yeah. come from where do fossils come from and so forth that it's yeah. just a huge as you say a huge diversity and some of them yeah some of them end up being gap theory people too so they have yeah. you know the earth is mm -hmm. uncount uncountless millions of years old but there was a global flood that produced this massive amount of of the fossil record so yeah. it's just a it's a strange reading through them it's really strange because there's just this weird they don't fit into modern categories at all they they have no. all sorts of strange ideas no there, there's there's lots in in the scriptural geologists that sort of resonate with young age creationists today but they that it's certainly a very very kind of mixed bag isn't it yeah yep. um and and that's really and and they have no impact i mean they right. they are they are regarded as fringe they're yep. they're they're kind they're of written kind of off kooky. as kind of cranks and yep. Yep. you know so that they they really don't have very much impact and that's really the situation as we get into the 20th century yep and that's where macready price comes in so right. macready price in those early decades of the 20th century um essentially revives this idea of flood geology and uh you know he he's self-taught uh he's pretty much an armchair geologist he's not really a, f a field geologist um of, of any kind but he revives this idea of of um flood geology and he's prolific you know he yeah. He churns out book after book after book, <laughs> yes. and um, if if you've read some of his books, they're often quite sort of samey. Um, but you know, he he is the twentieth century, early twentieth century champion of yeah. uh, of flood geology, and that's you know who Morris picks up in nineteen forty three. Yeah. Yeah. However, um, Macready Price was not the only one. Um, because uh, MacReady Price had a student called Harold W. Clark. Mm -hmm. And uh, Harold Clark um, published a number of books of his own uh, throughout the uh, sort of mid to, to later part of the 20th century. 
uh, on flood geology. But he sort of clashed with Price, didn't he? They yes, they had some yeah. fallings out because they did not see eye to eye about some some things. Harold Clark, um, to his credit, was was a, was much more of a field geologist. He actually wanted yeah. to go out and look at the rocks for himself, and. Uh, so he ended up disagreeing with with Price, particularly about the reality of the geological column and the fossil sequence and things of this kind. And uh, if you want to kind of dig into some of those um, inter inter Nissan debates uh, among creationists, then we we did a couple of episodes, didn't we, on the history of the geological yeah, column and its interpretation. Yep. So 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 have a look at those, but. Harold Clark, um, one of the uh, books that he writes is this uh, book, The New Diluvialism. I think this was 1946, if I remember rightly. And uh, Harold Clark, um, he actually originates this idea of the fossil sequence uh, being explained in terms of the ecological distribution of organisms in the pre-flood world. That's right. So yeah. the ecological zonation idea, it comes from this book, 1946, Harold, Harold Clark, and he really originates that idea. So that's another sort of key piece of the puzzle if you're you're looking at the sort of development of these ideas within creationism. Uh, there's another uh, geologist, another, you know, the, these sort of handful of lonely voices, you know, in, in this sort of barren period. Um, one of them is is a guy called Clifford Burdick, who's a consulting geologist, um, and uh, he, you know, is also a champion of flood geology. Uh, this is not a book that uh, or a booklet that he wrote um, early on. This one actually dates, I think, from the nineteen seventies. Uh, but this is a book by Clifford Burdick, Canyon of Canyons. It's all about the geology of Grand Canyon, giving a kind of creationist reinterpretation of Grand Canyon. Uh, one name that people may be familiar with um, is Byron Nelson. I think a lot of people have come across this book, uh, The Deluge Story in yeah. Stone. Yeah. Uh, Byron Nelson was uh, a Lutheran. Uh, this book was published in uh, 1931 by a Lutheran publishing house. And again, you know, this is this is a kind of early flood geology mm -hmm. uh, treatise, essentially. And uh, that uh, this particular edition that I have here actually has a foreword by Henry Morris, um, who you know has has written the foreword to this this reprint. And then in 1951, uh, another Lutheran, um, uh, Alfred Raywinkle, writes this book. The Flood in the Light of the Bible, Geology, and Archaeology. And uh, this book, again, you know, you can read it and see in it many of the ideas that would then later um, become popular through the publication of the Genesis Flood. Uh, but it's, it, it's very interesting, isn't it, that we have all of these sort of precursors, but they just don't make the impact right. that ultimately the Genesis Flood makes. Yeah. The, the Genesis flood just comes along, as you explained, at that particular at that moment in history yep. where, you know, it just it just kind of exploded onto the scene yeah. and really was the catalyst for a worldwide revival of, of young age creationism in the second half of the 20th century. And I think that's what we're going to come on to talk about in the uh, second part of this discussion next time, isn't uh. it? Yes, I look at my clock down here. I think we are out of time. Um, yeah, this has been this has been fascinating. Uh, the history of this book is is at least as interesting to me as what's in it. Um, mm. Sixty years out of date now, so some of yeah. it I'm looking at and thinking, no, I don't think so. Uh, we've learned a lot in, in those sixty mm. years, but at the same time, it was this. It was such an amazing, an amazing point to hit that book at just the right time mm. uh and it just yeah it basically is why so many of us are where we are today mm. um absolutely so thank you all for listening and for watching um if you would like to know more about our podcast we are on uh 
uh, social media. You can find us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Twitter. You will find our uh, podcast, the audio, available on whatever your favorite podcast platform is. We're probably there. Um, do leave us a like, uh, five stars, ten stars, all the stars. Give us, give us everything. Um, we appreciate your support. You can also find out more about us and notes from the show at corsi.org slash podcast. That's C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot O-R-G slash podcast. And you can also email us at podcast at corsi.org. That's the way to reach out if you would like to make some suggestions or reflect on our episode, tell us where we're wrong. We're always happy for all of our emails to tell us where we're wrong, right? Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, check that out and learn about our ministry, our, our ministries, Core Academy of Science sponsors this podcast. We're at coresci.org. You can find out how to support financially this work at coresci.org slash donate. And Paul, Biblical Creation Trust, where do I find that online? Yes, our website is biblicalcreationtrust.org. And again, there's all the information uh, on the website about who we are, what we do. Um, there's a donate button on the homepage. It will take you to all of the giving options. And uh, you can request our newsletter as well and, and, and join our mailing list. So, uh, yeah, you'll find it all there, biblicalcreationtrust.org. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time as we continue discussing the Genesis Flood. Bye for now. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Let's Talk Creation. If you have questions, send them to podcast at corsi.org. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at C-O-R-E-S-C-I dot org. And be sure to let your friends know about Let's Talk Creation. And check us out on social media. Thank you.